Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be with you, to be around people that I can relate with. I'm usually arguing or debating when I make appearances, so it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I started teaching in 1963 at uh, Watts David Starr Jordan High School. And this school has really rich history. Uh, this is a school that was used for busing in Los Angeles. Uh, this was the school that started all of these social programs that we have today. After the 1965 Watts riots, and the Macomb Commission came in and decided that one of the causes of the riots was poor quality education, and that our poor minority, our poor disadvantaged, and our ghetto, and our at-risk children needed special programs. Now, I say that because I am so happy that no one told me when I was growing up poor that I was at risk. And there's a reason that all of these euphemisms are placed on our children. And it's kind of funny because as I think about all the euphemisms that are used, I'm reminded of when Winston Churchill came to America and a luncheon buffet was given in his honor at which fried chicken was served. And Mr. Churchill went up for a second helping, and he said, may I have a breast? And his hostess said, oh, no, Mr. Churchill. In America, it's either dark meat or white meat. So the next morning, Mr. Churchill sent his hostess a beautiful cassage with the note, I'd be much obliged if you pinned this to your white meat. And this is the kind of thing that's happening in America, these kind of euphemisms. The reason that these labels are put on our children is because the government can then give more money to the schools, and the schools can then incorporate more and more programs. Now, all of us know how well phonics work. So why is it the schools are not using it? Well, because so much money comes in that they experiment with our children, and that's where your whole language and all that looks uh, same method. That's where it comes from. As a matter of fact, only recently our governor in California had to bribe the school bureaucracy there by saying that if they use phonics, he'll give them more money. And money is really the big problem we have here because in 1965, as a result of the McCone Commission, we were given the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. This act is what we have today, Title I, Chapter I, the food program. And I tell you, these government schools, they started off, kindergarten was not early enough for them to take our children from us. They then have child development and preschool. And of course, they use tragedies among families to implement even more of their socialist problems. Of course, it was a tragedy that led to the latchkey. You know the latchkey laws. And what did they say? We need to keep the schools open longer so the children would have a place to play or, or someone could watch them. Well, if you knew what was going on in your schools during the day, in government schools, you would not have your children there at all. Now, in the 33 years that I've been teaching, I have seen many, many, many programs come in. When I started in 1963, it was called Values Clarification. Kind of funny to me because my values were very clear. Moral absolutes, individual responsibility, civic duty. And so as I sat in that teacher's meeting, I kept wondering, what do they mean, Values Clarification? And like most teachers, the program as it's presented sounds good and you don't really know what it means until after it has been implemented and it sets in. What values clarification meant was that our children were to develop their own value system, which means that they have a valueless system. And of course, a year before I started teaching, we had that 1962 Congressional Act that took God out of our schools. And the big lie that was used 
well, we have to separate school and religion. We have to separate uh, church and state and this type of thing. We know that that is not the reason that God was taken out of our schools. But it was more than just taking God out. It was taking a sense of principles, a, set of, a sense of direction for our young children to direct their young lives. After values clarification, I went on to see one program after the other. We have peer counseling uh, where students are referred to a particular counselor who is especially trained for this. The students are referred by their teachers for whatever reason that the child is not responding to the teacher. Maybe the child has come to class red-eyed like I'm looking after my trip today, and the teacher assumes that the child is on drugs. Uh, the child may sleep in class, and the teacher will assume that the child is uh, having some kind of problems. And then they are referred to the peer counselor, and what the counselor does is ask them personal questions of what's going on in the home. And if there's any reason for a referral to um, Child Protective Services, that's where you find a lot of parents and a lot of homes that are being broken up. From peer counseling, we went from one program to the other. And of course, you are familiar with outcome-based education. What does that mean? It simply means that the children will show a certain behavior and as a result of that behavior that's acceptable to the schools, the child will then be given a certificate because they're going to do away with diplomas. And that certificate uh, will uh, allow them to work, which gives us our school to work and school to careers bill. Now, that was just passed this past April. But like many of these other programs, before it even gets to you, it's already been decided. And that's true with your school boards. One of the ways that I got involved in, in um, speaking out was in 1987, February of 87, the California State Department of Education decided that they would begin teaching homosexuality in our public schools, grades, kindergarten through 12. And so I organized a group of parents from Watts. We called ourselves black Americans for two reasons. One, we were all black, and two, that was the way to get the media, because at that time, if you had black or African in front of your name, they'd come out. And so as our group began to argue, and we presented a testimony as to how this is not what's in the best interest of our children, it didn't matter, because as I said, it was already decided. So from that, in 87, we now have coming out day in our schools. But even before then, in, in the mid-70s, we have what's called Project 10 that was instituted in our schools. Now, if this program is not in public schools here, believe me, it is on its way. I've been talking to small districts on my tour, and I'm finding out that all of these programs that begin in the belly of the beast, Los Angeles Unified School District, the second largest district in the nation, and then it spreads throughout America. Well, Project 10 is a homosexual recruitment program, and it was started by a lesbian high school counselor in Los Angeles who was entrusted with the weekend care of a young student a weekend competition, had an affair with a girl, and then decided from that that 10% of all of our students were homosexual. And so therefore, a counseling program was, was to be instituted. It's not a counseling program. It's a recruitment program. And I'll tell you how it works. I had an experience with it. Now, I must say here, there are many, many fine teachers out there. There are many good principals. Many times, principals try to ignore some of these programs because they know in their heart that it's wrong. Project 10 had been around, as I said, since the mid-70s, but at the particular school at which I was teaching uh, the past 11 years, two years ago, 
it became very popular on our campus because homosexuals came onto our staff and they promoted it. And I happen to have done a show that was entitled, Should Homosexuals Have the Right to Marry and Raise Children? And my students saw me on the show as they always do. They want to talk about it. And so we took a few moments to talk about it. And they asked me, how did I feel about Project 10? And I told them. Well, a few days later, the director of Project 10 walked into my classroom. And he said um, he wanted to talk with me. So I thought we would walk outside of the door, have a private conversation. But he stopped me in the middle of the floor in front of my class. And he said, I understand you said thus and so about Project 10. I said, yes, I said that, and I'll tell you what else I said. And I gave him my full opinion. So when he walked out of the room, the students applauded. And I said, why are you doing that? You already know my feelings about Project 10. And they said, oh, no, Mrs. Foster. We want you to know that we have to go to his classroom for our math classes. And on the wall in his classroom, he has these huge pictures and posters of half-naked men in sexually alluring positions, some darn near kissing. And it's so embarrassing, we can't concentrate on our math. I said, have you told your parents? Well, many of their parents are here illegally and don't get involved. And I said, have you told your other teachers? The other teachers tell us we must be tolerant. So I went to the principal, and he told me to mind my own business. Now, my students are my business. Whether they are here legally or not, as long as they're under my charge, I'm going to treat them right. So what I did, I went to the room to check for myself. Not only were the pictures up there, but then he had copies of homosexual papers in which they were advertising for young boys, teenage boys. I could not get anywhere for getting these posters off the wall until I went to the media and brought the media in. And then the posters came down. But I'm gone now, so I'm sure they're up again. And the reason that you have this is because you have your gay and lesbian commissions on your school boards and in your teachers' unions. And they are there to promote their political agenda. And now, today, we have what's called coming out day where teachers stand before their classes, kindergarten, kindergarten through 12th grade, announce that they're homosexual. They bring their mate in with them to talk about their lifestyle. They wear t-shirts, I'm not gay, my boyfriend is. And they're actually encouraging our children to emulate a very dangerous and unhealthy lifestyle. You might ask, where are the parents on this? Well. You know, we have in our schools today what I call professional parents. In many of your so-called inner city schools, they have an office on campus. And they are there to take care of the complaints of good, loving, decent, caring parents. These professional parents handle their complaints so that they can free the principal from having to listen to it or they act for the school board. And it used to be that the PTA was a volunteer group of parents that would come in. We have paid parents. Some of them make even more than teachers, and they are lobbyists. And as I said earlier, these programs were already decided before the parents even fill the school board. It doesn't matter that they fill the school boards. They go to these meetings, and they want their voices to be heard. Doesn't matter how much they complain, it's already been decided. And what the school boards will do, if they see these parents out there, then they put, put the item off of the agenda longer and longer. Parents may get there at 3 o'clock because that's the time it's supposed to be heard. 9 o'clock at night, they're still waiting for them to hear it. So they have all kind of strategies to undermine the parents. And of course, there are many reasons that we have the ills in education that we have today. Now, it started long before I entered into the, um, the teaching profession. And we can thank the psychologists and psychiatrists with their experimental programs on our children. And, and whether it's Skinner or Dewey or Thorndike, 
their theory was that man has no soul, no conscious, and only react to stimuli. And that is the way they have been teaching and treating our children. But since I have been in the school system, I blame political movements of the 60s for what's happening in our schools today. And I'm talking about the Chicano movement, the homosexual movement, the feminist movement, and the black movement. Now, how have they impacted our schools? Your Chicano movement now have us with an open border policy. They have our schools overcrowded due to illegal immigration. They have precious funding going mostly for bilingual education. That's the biggest funding goal pot there is. And to tell you the truth, that is why you heard of this ridiculous notion, Ebonics. It was nothing more than about money. All that meant was that, you see, before Ebonics, black teachers and black students were considered Americans and they spoke English. So they couldn't dip their fingers into this bilingual gold pot. Well, it was decided then that no, we're not black, we're Africans, and no, we don't speak English, we speak Ebonics. And as a result, they got the funding. Now, I was state co-chair along with Senator Ray Haynes from California to try to stop Ebonics. And I say that because Senator Haynes is white. If I had to depend on a black elected official to have helped me to stop this, it would have been dead to begin with. And they did defeat it, and they are now getting money for this ridiculous program that demeans black children. Then you have your feminist movement, and what have they given us? They now have abortion referrals coming from our public schools through these so-called health clinics, which are nothing more than sex clinics. And by the way, the latest to be introduced by all of these programs is called Healthy Start. It just started in Los Angeles. Now, doesn't that sound good, a healthy start? Who would not want a healthy start? What that means now is that we're going to have full-time nurses and full-time doctors on our school campuses, so your children won't have to tell you that they have venereal disease or any other problems. Everything will be taken care of right there at school. And also, they are now setting it up where all of the social services agencies are on campus so that if these parents are not yet signed up for a social program, they will get it. And I don't know how many of you have these food programs in your um, school lunch programs, they're called, even though they're serving them breakfast as well as lunch. And watch out, they'll be serving them dinner, too, before it's over with. But uh, all of this, these lunch programs, you know, when it started out with that 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act, it was supposedly uh, because poor children couldn't learn because they were hungry. If that's not the most insulting thing about poor, you know, being one who grew up poor, let me tell you something. Being poor means your pockets are empty, not your mind. Poor children can be trained and educated as well as any other if they are taught properly. But again, all of this was to get the government more and more involved and to undermine the parents. Now, I know that your Bill of Administration has already told you that it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> it takes parents whose authority is not undermined by a meddling socialist government as what we have now in Washington. That's what it takes. <laughs> And so we have had the, the Chicana movement and the feminist movement and, of course, the homosexual movement. And I've already told you uh, how much influence they have now in our public schools. And not only that, throughout our society, whoever would have thought that we would have to define marriage? And this is what they've done to us. But most importantly, 
And the one that really, really irks me more than any others is the black movement. And isn't it ironic that the very group of people who were brought to America as slaves are being used today to enslave all of Americans? Now that really hurts me being a member of that race and seeing how this happened. Now I have to tell you, I really don't remember going from being colored to Negro, but I grew up in the 40s and 50s as a Negro. It wasn't anything denigrating to us. All it meant was that our ancestors were brought to America through the slave trade from Africa. So we didn't think anything negative. We still looked forward to the American dream. And America was home to us. We thank them for coming over here. I know I do. I'm sorry how they came here, but I thank God that they did come. There's no way in the world I would want to be any place on the African continent today, which is something else. Here you have our young children being told that they're African Americans, and you ask them what country they are from, and they don't even know Africa is a continent and not a country. And that's the kind of lies that's going on in our government schools today, and it's being promoted by these political groups. Because all of these groups I mentioned to you all work together. They support each other. If they're having a rally, they all come or if they are uh, standing together on an issue, whatever the issue may be, affirmative action, illegal immigrant, it doesn't matter. They all coalesce as one. Now, when I talk about black leaders, which is what I'm going to discuss, because I want you to know why you have multiculturalism and diversity in our schools today, and why you have corporations that's demanding that their workers uh, learn about diversity which is so ridiculous. I've been on this earth more than half a century, and as long as I've been in America, it's always been diverse. So I've been wondering, what do they mean by that? But what they mean is that they want to divide us. They want to divide America and keep Americans hating each other. And they're teaching our children hatred and disdain for America by teaching them every other culture but their own. There's only one culture that should be taught in American schools, and that's American culture. <laughs> At any rate, uh, growing up as a Negro, you know, we really didn't have the kind of hatred that I see today. I can remember in high school, like high school children today will maybe go to the mall and window shop. Well, we would leave our high school and we'd go downtown to the big expensive stores and window shop. And there you had the colored only and the white only drinking fountains. And I could remember we, well, you know, in high school, you're little rebels anyway. So we would drink from the white fountain and the sales clerks would say, now you know you're supposed to drink colored water. And we'd say, if we wanted colored water, we'd drink Kool-Aid. And they would laugh. We'd all laugh about it. But if you would listen to the black leaders today, you would think we were lynched for not drinking out of the colored only fountain. And I'm saying that to make the point that even though you had laws that separated the people, uh, segregation, Jim Crow laws, the people themselves did not hate each other the way our children are being taught to hate other races today. And that is the difference, and that's how I grew up as a Negro. But then when I was leaving college, and then in the 60s, our name was changed to Black Americans. And the reason for that, that was the height of the black political movement. And so all of us then were to show that we acted as one, whether we were colored or Negro or black. So from then on, we became known as black Americans. Well, then when the media began to cover the fight against apartheid in South Africa, the Reverend Ain't Jesse Jackson called a press conference and told the media from now on, refer to us as African Americans. That's how we became African Americans. And the purpose for that was so that all of us would be in goose step with the African National Congress. Simple as that. But again, look at what it has done to our children and in our schools. 
And some of our public schools in these uh, so-called inner city schools or minority schools, you would be hard pressed to find old glory flying in the classroom at all. But you will see foreign flags. And for us, they make up a flag. And they call it an African-American flag. They make up an African-American Pledge of Allegiance. They make up a culture. And I'm talking about Kwanzaa, a made-up culture. But it's been so accepted with, by so many people, even Texaco got in trouble for not recognizing it as a legal holiday for their employers. Totally made up. I worked with the guy at the school who made it up. At the time, in the 60s, he formed an organization called U.S. United Slaves. He and his United Slaves had a shootout with the Black Panthers in the cafeteria of UCLA, in which two people were killed. Later, he was sentenced for torturing two of his female followers. He resurfaced, changed his name. Now he's head of the Black Studies Department in one of our major universities in California, spruing more hatred. And you know, when we talk about these black history classes and African American studies, that's nothing more than, again, promoting hatred. And there's not very much truth, if any at all, in some of the studies that they give these young people. But how do we get to all of this? Now, you will hear me talk about the black leaders tonight, and I want you to know exactly who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the NAACP, the Urban League, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congressional Black Caucus, the Reverend A. Jackson and his group, and Calypso Louis and his Nation of Islam. Now, people kind of laugh when I say Calypso Louis, but he is a Calypso singer turned Muslim minister. And so he, he knows how to charm people. He knows how to entertain people. And once he snares them in, he begins to sprue his hatred. And he's already told us he wants a separate nation, a, a separate state in America. And I tell you, with this Billary administration giving away so much of what we have to the United Nations, I wouldn't be surprised if we woke up one morning and he would give one of our states away, because he loves to play that race card. Clinton plays the race card better than anyone I've seen. Now, this African-American flag, you may have seen it. If you watched the Militia Man March back in 1995 in our nation's capital, I know you may think it was the Million Man March, but it was the Militia Man March. What it was, you see, when, when Jackson brought Farrakhan to prominence in 84, Farrakhan made the statement, there's going to be a race war in America, and young black gang members will be used. Nobody said anything. That was at the same time that Jackson offended uh, the Jews. Uh, and so, yeah, the, of course, the Jewish leaders just jumped right on that issue. But not one black organization said anything when Farrakhan said that. A few months later, in early 1985, Libya's Gaddafi gave Farrakhan $5 million. With that money, from 1985 to 1995, Farrakhan bought out forums and convention centers throughout America to sprue his hatred. And then he showed what that million dollars, $5 million bought by having his million man march. I happened to have been sitting in CNN studios at the time that they covered this march. And while I was waiting to be interviewed, Leon Harris of CNN, of CNN interviewed a Crip and a Blood. And there they were with their caps, the coming revolution, the uprising next time. And they told Leon Harris, the reason we did what we did to our community is because of lack of leadership. And that's why we're here for Minister Farrakhan. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what these little hoodlums did to the community. They beat, maim, and kill innocent children besides selling drugs to them. 
Some of these children were killed, <clears throat> excuse me, sitting in their own living rooms watching television. That's what they did. And who were their leaders as they did this? The most powerful politician in the state of California at the time, some say even more than the governor, Willie Brown, black. Their congressional representative at the time, Augustus Hawkins, black. Their state senator, black. Their state assembly representative, Murky Waters, known to you as Maxine. <laughs> their mayor, Tom Bradley. Their city council representative had been on the council so long, he was known as the emperor. Now with all of that leadership over Watson, South Central Los Angeles, you would think we'd have the closest knit families, the highest achieving schools, and the safest streets. No. What we had, we had U.S. News and World Report, Time, Newsweek Magazine, all writing about us because we were known as the killing fields, the war zone. This is Beirut, USA. And here were these gangsters who terrorized the community talking about lack of leadership. It's the wrong kind of leadership. That's really what it was. And so what they're doing is that they're turning children against each other. There's hardly a month goes by in Los Angeles. There's not a fight between blacks and whites or, or blacks and Mexicans or you name it. They are fighting because they're being taught all of this hatred. And this is the problem that, that we're having in our, in our government schools. Now, when I talk about all of these uh, political movements again, recognize that they are in the schools. They're ingrained. They're not going any place. So that's why we need to take our children out if they are in there. And I compliment those of you who are homeschooling or those of you who have your children in private schools and Christian schools, because your children will be our hope for tomorrow. Now, <laughs> I know that um, many times I'm asked, gee, all of this is so horrible. What are we going to do? What we need to do? We need to recognize that all of these programs that's causing the problems that we're facing in our schools today come from the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. And as long as we remain in the United Nations, we will continue to go downhill until they have totally controlled us. And we're not too far away from that now. I tell my atheist friends, you know, if we survive, Bill Clinton, you've got to believe there's a God. <laughs> and I believe they do. <laughs> now, uh, some people may think, well, you know, I'm saying this because of uh, political affiliation. When I became 21, which was voting age at the time, I registered and became an active Democrat. Well, how could I not? Everybody in my community were Democrats. I, that's all I knew. Sort of reminds me of the little girl who was watching her mother prepare a chicken for uh, roasting. And she asked her mother, she says, Mom, why do you cut the wings off the chicken before you put it in the pot? And her mother said, oh, I saw my mother do it, so I just do it. And so the little girl went to her grandmother, and she says, Grandma, I asked mother why she cuts the wings off the chicken before she puts it in the pot, and she said she does it because she saw you do it. And the grandmother said, well, I don't know. My mother did it, so I did it. So fortunately for the little girl, her great-grandmother was still alive. And she went to her, and she asked her. And she said, you know, I've asked my mom, I've asked grandma, and they told me why they did it, and why did you, did you do it? And her great-grandmother looked at her and she says, well, the pot was too small and that's the only way I could get the chicken to fit. <laughs> well, you know, that's how it was with us Democrats at the time. Everyone in the community, our family, were all Democrats and so we just did it because they did it. But after 17 years in the Democrat Party, I realized 
that they, they did not represent my strong belief in God, my strong belief in America, my strong belief in family, so I switched parties. Well, after 17 years in the Republican Party, I have to tell you, today I'm a conservative without a party. <laughs> and that's unfortunate. <laughs> but if we really want to take care of our problems, if we want America to remain as strong as she is free, then what we need to do is get out of the United Nations because this is where all of these policies and, and all of our problems are coming from. And right now, our children in some schools, in some of these government schools, like I told you, they don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. They don't have old glory. They don't say the Pledge of Allegiance to America. And I think that's because the government may find out that the children in saying the pledge will realize America is a republic, not a democracy. And so that's one of the reasons they have taken away the Pledge of Allegiance, because they're teaching our children that we're a democracy. And our children don't know the difference. Our children are not being taught the Declaration of Independence. And again, the children might then realize that they're entitled to three basic rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, or property. That's all. And the government don't want them to know that not your government schools, because they have the children think that their rights are for taxpayers to feed them, clothe them, educate them, medicate them, the whole bit. And of course, don't mention the Constitution in our schools, because then our children may realize that we have an executive branch and a judiciary this to and a Congress that's totally ignoring our Constitution. So these are the reasons that this, these kind of teachings have been denied our children. And I will tell you, I, um, I really can see the results of this as I do some of these talk shows. I happen to have done a talk show in which the, um, the audience were mostly uh, blacks. And one young man called in and identified himself as such and said that um, he was 30 years old. And he wanted to take exception to a comment that I had made. And what I said was that I believe all of us would be a lot better off if we simply followed two important documents, the Bible and the Constitution. And he called in so irate. He said, now, little sister, and when they call me little sister, I know I'm in for bashing them. He said, how can you say that? We aren't even mentioned in the Constitution. And I said, I don't know if there's any race of people mentioned in the Constitution, but if there is any one race single out, it is us. Because of the two amendments that were introduced uh, uh, of the Constitution because of us. And then he says, well, you know, the Constitution, that part about us voting changes every 15 years. Where do they get this information? And if, because the, what's going on in our schools, it's just like the outcome-based education. They're not taught right from wrong. If they don't know two and two is four, perhaps they'll figure it out before they graduate because the teacher will not dare hurt their self-esteem by telling them that they're wrong and, that, and correcting them. And the, the people I know with the highest self-esteem are those who know how to read, write, and calculate. So it's not about teaching our children these things that are important to them. It's all about what feels good to them and all about as long as they can reach certain behaviors, then fine. Now, the School to Work Bill, as you know, will do away with diplomas and give our children certificates which will allow them to work. And this will be true not only for our children, but for everyone. And this is reaching into our private schools and our home schools also. And that's what's so very dangerous. Because we're not only fighting school boards, we're fighting legislations, uh, legislators also. And again, these groups, they get themselves into these positions 
where they can change laws or they can make laws to accommodate their political agenda. And we have to be aware of this. And you know, with all that I've said, people will say, well, what's the answer? And the answer is what I've said. Get us out of the United Nations. Now, how can we do this? Congressman Ron Paul, our hero, introduced the bill to get us out of the United Nations and look at the number of votes he got. Twice the amount that we had received before when this bill was, was introduced. Next year, in 1998, we should all make it a point that any candidate we elect to Congress will make it top priority to get us out of the United Nations. And then, then we can get back to work in strengthening our country. <clears throat> and you know, I have to go back to uh, the, the black leaders because they are having such an impact on, on America. And I remember in 1986, Senator Hayakawa sent me an article from a San Francisco paper, and it was entitled, Why Worry About Farrakhan? And he attached a little note, Isola, I Do Worry. Now, some of you may only remember Senator Hayakawa for um, sleeping in Senate hearings. But when I'm reminded of that, I, I think of the time that um, when Edward Everett Hale was chaplain of the Senate, and someone asked him, Dr. Hale, do you ever pray for the senators? And Dr. Hale responded, no, I look at the senators and I pray for the people. <laughs> and, but I have to agree that we should worry because these groups are acting as one and they're acting to divide America. And you were talking about one state. I was in Lafayette, Louisiana, the two Sundays ago, October the 19th. Two days before I arrived that Friday, and it was all on the news that weekend, the NAACP leader there had appeared before the city council because the blacks want to secede from the northern part of Lafayette. They want their own black section. Now you have to wonder, here is the group that pushed for integration and now they want separation. When I was a junior in high school, it was, um, I remember that the NAACP had filed a lawsuit to integrate the schools, and it worked. So the Texas legislature said, well, OK, we have Houston College for Negro right here, few blocks away, well, miles at that time, we had the University of Houston. And so the Texas State Legislature said, well, OK, we'll merge the two schools and make it one large university. The NAACP said, oh, no, we want to keep our black school. So Houston College for Negroes became Texas Southern University. And that is where I got my first degree. I took my husband back there in 1990, I believe it was. And I wanted him to see where I had attended school. Texas Southern University has grown so close, University of Houston has grown so close that they put up a brick wall in the middle of the street so they couldn't get any closer. <laughs> now isn't that a sad commentary? But that's how powerful these black leaders have become. And I am so, so disheartened when I heard the Christian Coalition the promise keepers apologizing for slavery. Let me tell you what that's all about, folks. There's a guilt feeling being put on America. And the reason is there's a bill floating around. It comes up, and then they figure it's not time. And so it's still floating in Congress called reparations for slavery. And so as soon as this guilt feeling has been put off across America, then it will be time to pass the bill. Now let me tell you, they're talking about a million dollars for everyone whose ancestor or anyone that had Negro blood in them. 
you would be surprised at the number of people that will end up with Negro blood for a million dollars. <laughs> you know? But this is how crazy it has become. And we do have hope because Congress is still the people's house. And this is really great times when you look at it. We have an opportunity to show the type of pioneer spirits of our founding fathers. We have an opportunity to be bold and to come together and to fight for this nation of ours. Now, I hear people say, well, you know, we have to do it incrementally. Hmm. No. They have treated us like frogs in boiling water, but we have got to jump out immediately and turn around and say no more. This is our country. It's an independent nation, and this is how we want to keep it. There is no hope for education. Once we get out of UNESCO, get UNESCO out, then we get rid of the Department of Education, get rid of the um, NEA. Don't fund these things and they will go away. But you know what? I'm really disgusted at all of these big corporations and the businessmen that's allowing this to happen, that's sponsoring this, that's spending all of this money. These groups are well organized, well funded. I, I asked today, you know, where are all of the big time millionaire Republicans and all of them with money. And they're practically given to the same groups. And so these, these are really big problems for us. But you know what? We still are strong enough as long as we do not let ourselves be separated by race, by class, or by any other means. Because first and foremost, we are Americans, and this is still his favorite land. And when I say God, I'm not talking about the God that was used by Farrakhan when he told the people in Iran that God will give Muslims the honor of destroying America. I'm talking about the God that is known through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave us this great country. And I don't think he's going to let us lose it. But we've got to turn to him, and we've got to turn to each other, and we've got to think with our heads, not our hearts, and stop feeling guilty. It takes all of us working together. And I'm so happy to, to, um, to be with you tonight. And I just want to end by saying, um, even though I'm on a speaking tour for the John Birch Society, that doesn't mean that I have to be a member of John Birch Society, but I am, and a very proud member at that. And it was really funny because I, when I was in Cleveland, I was doing a radio talk show, and again, it was predominantly black audience, and this guy called in and he said, how could a black woman like you be a member of that Ku Klux Klan organization? And I started to tell him, well, I'm the grand dragoness, but of course I didn't because he probably wouldn't have taken it as a joke. And I asked him, and I said, well, what do you know about John Birch Society? And he says, well, I heard and I heard, and everything was I heard. So I gave him the number to call 1-800-JBS-USA-1 and get the correct information. But, you know, the kind of name calling that's going on, that's been going on, of course, I heard all of these names too, racist organization, right wing organization. And it was kind of funny because when I thought back, I remember when we first started off as black Americans for family values, the media would refer to us as a civil rights organization. But the minute we dropped the hyphen, once we got established and we became Americans for family values, then we were referred to as a right-wing bigoted organization. And when I was doing debates for Proposition 187, fighting against illegal immigration, during the debates with the NAACP and the Urban League representatives there, um, they never once used African American. Everything was people of color. That's how they referred to us. So that's the next name change on the horizon for us, by the way. But 
the thing is that I was called a white supremacist, and I thought, that takes the cake. <laughs> what else can they call me? And I knew then there, there must have been some really good things that the John Birch Society is doing to be called all of those names. But I really didn't think very much about it until I happened to have appeared on Larry King Live and a gentleman, Dave Jorgensen, from Salt Lake City, Utah, called and got my husband on the telephone. And turned out they were kindred souls. They must have talked for about an hour. And then my husband said, oh, well, you're going to Utah. Are you going to speak for at this rally, God, country, and family, and so forth? And we met Dave and his family, wonderful people. And he took us on a tour of the Mormon temple because they are Mormons. And then as Dave was taking us to the airport, he said, um, I want you to read this. You know how you birches do. You start giving us all this material to read, books and magazines and so forth. But my husband and I just kind of glanced through. We didn't really read like we should have, and we just went on. And then I had a chance to do a tour, a Northern California tour for the society, and I met so many wonderful people, minorities of all kinds, blacks, uh, uh, Mexicans, uh, Jews, you name it, all people of different religions, but they all had one thing in common the love for America and the love of God. And so I was impressed with that, but my husband is not the kind to really get involved in organizations because we have been courted by so many organizations in the many years that we've been out here fighting. But we found they were all eat, meet, and retreat organizations, and we didn't have that kind of time. And then we notice how the John Birch Society educates the public. You don't even have to be a member to get their trim magazine to find out how your representatives are voting. Now, people talk all the time about the apathy of voters and why they keep putting the same people in. Well, if you have a candidate that comes in and tells you that you know, all of you will have a chicken in your pot, you're going to vote for them because you want the chicken. But if you don't really pay attention to what's going on, and that's what I liked about the society, because they put out information, whether or not your representative is following the Constitution in his vote. So we were impressed with that. And then finally, we had a chance to visit again with Dave and his family. And this time, Dave was really smart. He didn't trust us to read anything. He left really early for the airport. That we sat at this park bench, and. He had this box of material, and he answered all of our questions, and we read right there with him. And when we got back home, my husband and I decided, and we became John Birch members in November of 1996. And I have to tell you this, my husband is tall, dark, and handsome, bald head. You would think he's one of those Nation of Islam Muslims if you saw him. And you should see him when he walks through Austin, South Central, with his John Birch Society shirt on. Everyone's <laughs> and they won't dare say anything to him. I mean, he grew up there, and he knows all of the crooks, too, and they know him, and he's pretty tough. So at any rate, I just wanted to say this to you, because um, a week before I came here, I spoke to a Republican women group in um, Leisure World, and there was a lady who came up afterwards, and she talked with me, had a really interesting background. She had worked with the FBI and undercover for them, CIA and so forth. And she was complimenting me on everything that I had said, but then she said to me, you know, honey, if I were you, I wouldn't tell people I'm a member of the John Birch Society. And I said, well, you know what? If I were ashamed of the organization, I wouldn't be a member of it. I'm very proud, and I want the world to know it. And I'm so happy to be here with you. And again, thank you very, very much.